patient side of the story. Stories by Servier Sackley Patient Board. Hello and welcome to Paris Sackley for this edition of The Patient Side of the Story, a series of podcasts which was born out of the close collaboration between the Servier Group and members of the Servier Sackley Research and Development Patient Board. This board works with the Servier teams to ensure patients' perspectives are taken into account at the new Servier R&D Institute at Paris Sackley. And these podcasts are a key feature of this, listening carefully to patients' individual experiences which they've been kind enough to share with us. In this series, we're talking mostly about adults, but today we're going to focus on younger patients. And for that, we're joined by Begonia and Thomas. Thank you both very much indeed for joining us. I'm sorry, Tom. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thomas, can I start by asking you, could you just first introduce yourself and tell us about your condition? Absolutely. Uh, so I'm a patient engagement consultant with around six, six or seven years experience now. And I work with patient organizations, pharmaceutical companies, contract research organizations, regulators, uh, and medical communications companies. And I'm also um, a person with cystic fibrosis, which is a life-limiting condition, which affects primarily the digestive and respiratory systems. And I was diagnosed when I was six weeks old, and I'm 35 now. Thanks a lot for that introduction, Thomas. And Begonia, let me turn to you. And just to be clear, you don't have a medical condition, but you do have first-hand knowledge of helping people who in some cases are severely unwell. Uh, Just tell us a bit about what you do. Yeah, my role is helping the involvement of children and young people in projects about clinical trials and innovation at St. John the Children's Hospital. This is a field in which, you know, advocacy, lobby, and of course, get more evidence about the impact it's necessary. As you said, I'm not a patient in first person, but uh, we need to bear in mind that everybody is a patient at some point. And when you realize about the needs of uh, the adult patients and, of course, the children and the young people, you see the benefit to advocate for be sure that they are part uh, of any research project that will be addressed to investigate and, and to improve their health. And Begonia, just to be clear, this is something you started doing at a very early age. Could you tell us why that was? Yeah, in my case, beyond that I'm working now as a professional in the field, I'm the caregiver of my brother. He has cerebral palsy. He was he was born with this condition. And I know from no, uh, my personal experience and in first person what are the needs of the caregivers. And I have been involved before to work at St. John Children's Hospital in several patients' organizations, supporting to move forward the, the capabilities, the, you know, any expertise and skills that patients they need to be part of of research. And Thomas, let me turn back to you. You mentioned you were diagnosed when you were very young. Can you remember how medical professionals spoke to you then? And can you remember examples of them really getting it wrong, perhaps, when they spoke to you? And could they perhaps sound patronising? Yeah. um, You know, first of all, I should mention that, you know, respect for autonomy is something that more or less everybody agrees on, uh, regardless of the age of the patient, but getting it right is... Is something very different. Um, I have to say, though, my, my direct care team were more or less fantastic. You know, having having a disease like cystic fibrosis is a complicated emotional thing. There's no there's no two ways about it. Um, but my specific situation was complicated by the fact that my dad is a GP. So when I was younger, um, I have very kind of clear memories of my doctors talking to my dad rather than me, even when I was kind of, you know, 12 or 13 kind of thing, which which I, looking back, I found frustrating, but I did not understand what was difficult or awkward about that fact. Um, so my care team were great, you know, and right now, at age 35, it feels like family. You know, I have a lot less to do with them than I used to. But the issues came up when I was um, particularly unwell, when I would need um, supportive care from people like urology surgeons. And I remember... I remember um, one surgeon complaining to me that my patient notes were too thick, too heavy. There was too much kind of information for him. Um, And I just think, you know, again, you look back as an adult and you understand why that's inappropriate. But at the time, you just kind of feel guilty and responsible for it, which I I can't really explain. You know, I suppose you're naive. Um, And I think so much um, of advocating for your own interests um, when it comes to your health is learning from experience. So ultimately, it's led me to a better place of empowerment. Uh, but those lessons are difficult. Thanks for sharing that. And Begonia, does some of what Thomas has been saying sound familiar to you? 
Yeah, of course. This is uh, one of the challenges that we face in pediatrics, the involvement of the patients in the decision-making process, because as an adult, we think that no, we have the right perspective, the right capabilities and responsibility to take decisions on behalf of the, of the children. But this is not the right approach because probably what matters to the children and about their expectations or their needs, probably it's a different perspective from, from the parents or other caregivers or also the professionals. And something that we are working uh, hard in terms of advocacy is to recognize that children and young people, they have the right to contribute to any decision that matters their health. And we need to facilitate the right means to listen them. And of course, clinical trials, it's an area in which we need to listen them. And you know, it's mandatory, the legal requirement to ask the assent of them to be part in a research project. But still, it's an area that it sounds very familiar for me because it's a lot of work it's still to, to be done because we take for granted many things on behalf of the children. And Begonia, as you mentioned, you're a patient advocate. How do you get children involved in the process? And what sort of information do you get from them? We try to involve children and young people if it's feasible at the same age in which is uh, a legal requirement to be involved in the decision process to, to participate in a research project. Of course, they are naive in science, clinical trials and all this stuff. And from the, the perspective of the professionals that we are working in, in this field in many European children's hospitals across Europe, what it's really important for us is educate, first of all. We need to empower them in the field. And secondly, work with the right methodologies that make easy their process to involve children and young people. Listen them. Usually when you listen the patients, and of course not only the children and, and, and the young people, also the adult patients, the requirements and, and the needs that they have in regards of research are feasible. And what we need to do is also help to change the mindset of the professionals involved in the in the design of clinical trial protocols. Because at least in pediatrics, usually we work with protocols that initially were designed for adults. And it's so difficult from the side perspective and, and from the professionals to really, you know, execute these trials with uh, pediatric patients because it's another world. And something that also we need to take into account is that it's not only, only the children, the one that is involved in the trial, it's the whole family. And I think that, yeah, it's very important this, this tandem between the empowerment and the right methodology to facilitate to get their feedback and, and their experience in the, in the clinical trials. And Thomas, just casting your mind back again to when you were a child and a young adult, this must have meant considerable interruption to your education. And I'm just wondering, looking back on it, how well do you think you coped? I coped with it very badly at times. Um, and I, I, one of my regrets is that I lived with shame for so long. And I wish I didn't because it manifested in my interpersonal relationships. And how I look back now as a 35-year-old man to when I was between, I don't know, 16 to 22, I, I look at myself as a weak person masquerading as a strong person. Um, and, you know, the, the, the difficult thing about being unwell with a disease like cystic fibrosis when you are often 80 miles away from your friends uh, and your school is, especially at that age when nobody, none of your friends can drive, you know, it's an incredibly isolating experience. Uh, you miss out on all a lot of formative um, experiences. And cystic fibrosis, along with many other diseases, test your relationships in ways that they're not designed to be tested at an age when you cannot handle the emotional fallout of those relationships breaking or fracturing or sort of malfunctioning. Um, and then my own sort of, um, what's the word, therapeutic breakthroughs came came when... I apply commitment and consistency um, to what I do. You know, my relatively speaking, until recently, my medication regime had not changed at all. But how I apply it, i.e., taking my medications when I'm supposed to, taking what I need to take when I need to take it, um, and exercising, has really changed my life now. And um, but to be perfectly honest with you, Tom, right now I'm very happy. I work in an area that I'm incredibly passionate about, and I can't say the same for a lot of the people at my age. Thanks, Thomas. And Begonia, just listening to what Thomas was saying about the phases he went through from being a child to a young adult, it really highlights one of the challenges of working with children, because it's a mistake, isn't it, to think of children as just one group. And the way you speak to a 16-year-old is completely different to how you speak to a 10-year-old, isn't it? Yeah, this is correct. Sometimes we think that children and young people, as you said, 
too much, it's only one group, but this is not the real world. We have from, you know, uh, newborns and also we, we work to involve the, the parents in, in this case to represent the, the rights and, and to listen their needs. But also we have children, we have, uh, you know, uh, teenagers and it's a very diverse group of, uh, patients and with different needs. But in any case, listen, uh, Thomas, what, uh, I just remember is that the challenge, it's not only one, of course, are several, but, uh, the, the cross-cutting, you know, challenge that we need to, to work is to really design pediatric clinical trials and think, no, which are the needs of these children and young people according to their age, because still they are children and young people. They are in a school. They deserve to go out with friends. And sometimes when we design these studies, <laughs> it's the children in the hospital or at home and, and that's it. No social life, no, no way to, you know, to manage or to deal the school with, uh, research. And this is something that it's most, uh, you know, it's really common. Sometimes we don't realize about the pressure that we are, you know, putting to the children and to the family on top, of course, of the standard of care. That in some cases also it's not easy to, to deal. Thanks for that, Begonia. And Thomas, just going back to what you were saying about what you've been through, and I'm wondering what made you want to get involved with patient advocacy? And can you tell us a bit about what that actually involves? Yeah. Um, so how I found advocacy, I looked, started looking for um, public engagement opportunities for, for various non-profits and charities and stuff like that. And um, I can remember, it gives me goosebumps thinking about it. When I did my first ever thing, uh, my, when I, I had my first ever um, opportunity, I went to London. It was completely unpaid, but I connected with an organization called Genetic Alliance. Um, and there was all kinds of people there. They could be, you know, they could have, uh, they could be, uh, leukemia, um, advocates, diabetic advocates, um, people with cystic fibrosis, their supporters, you name it kind of thing. And it was the first ever time that I connected with people who knew what it was like to not have a straightforward life. And for me, it was like instant. I knew this is where I belong. This is what I want to do. And, and it was just, it was, it just simply made sense. Um, and right now I wouldn't change a single thing about it. Um, uh, I'm grateful to be honest. Uh, the work that I do in Serbia uh, varies. Um, but basically it's about how companies like Serbia can make work more closely and in more meaningful ways with patients. It could be, um, helping them to develop, um, a startup incubator and how to connect that startup to the patient community. It could be um, helping Serbia to design hybrid decentralized trials, or it could be something like connecting the inside of a building, like their new research campus, uh, with a patient-centric mindset. And just picking up on the issue of support and support groups, because in other editions we've talked about how important they are. Do these groups exist for children and how do they work? Begonia? Yes, there are different kind of ways to involve uh, children and there are already established groups of patients that we have trained and educated specifically to be involved in health science projects. The name of these groups are Young Persons Advisory Groups. At San Juan de Day we have one with the name Kids Barcelona, it's our youth council and we met with them once per month. But at the European level there are many other groups, more than 30, and together we work in a unique network. The name is the White Bank Net. And we work together in these collaborative projects that ensure that also beyond to involve children and, and young people in research, we get also the perspective of diversity because every country has different standards of care. There are many factors that also are part of the decision uh, process of children and of the acceptability to be part of uh, research. And for us, work at the European level, it's the great way to try to replicate the same approach that a clinical trial can have. But in this case, with uh, activities of patient involvement. And Thomas, you were saying earlier about how as you got more mature, you accepted your reality more, your, you came to terms with your condition. Um, and I'm just wondering, when you were a child, was there perhaps not quite so much support around? It, it's definitely a combination of that. You know, I, I think the conversation on mental health and accepting help and being publicly, you know, visible um, in your acceptance of help was it just didn't really exist in the sort of early 2000s, if you know what I mean. It was, at the time, emotional support or any sort of connection to community was for the really mentally ill people. That was all that existed. It was very binary. It was very black and white. Um, right now, it's not the same. I have to say, when it comes to parents and supporters of people with, um, you know, chronic um, conditions or rare disease um, or, or significant poor health in any way, um, it's, it's more of a blind spot. 
um, which is actually half the problem. <laughs> because the other half of the problem is for people like my parents' age, uh, my parents' generation, um, who both my parents are in their early sixties now. Um, so you could you could sign post health um, support to them all day long, but getting these people to accept it. That's a completely different conversation, unfortunately. So it is out there. It's not as um, well established as direct support is at the moment. Um, but actually, I think the, the whole conversation on mental health is generally doing towards people to being willing, um, ready and able to accept this help into their life. Begonia, what about you as a primary caregiver? Do you need support? And is that support available? Yeah, yes, Thomas, we need support because, you know, deal with a, a relative with a health condition, it's not easy. As you can imagine, some of these conditions are degenerative and it means that depend- the dependency, the needs, the time of, uh, you know, to provide care to, to your relatives will be, you know, uh, more complex little by little in the, in the future. In some organizations that probably they are taking care of our relatives, there is this, uh, psychological support, but it's not a common or a standard practice because sometimes we think about health conditions and we think about healthcare, but we forgot the psychosocial dimension of health. And of course, we forgot the caregivers or, you know, other kind of, uh, relatives, uh, that can be involved taking care of the patients. It's a huge need. And also I can mention from my professional experience that it's a request from the parents because in some cases these children are involved for many years in a clinical trial. Probably they, they started their participation when they were young, but at the end of the trial, probably they are teenagers and for them it's not easy to deal with uh, this. And also they see things, they see if they are, you know, in a good shape or not. And it's, you know, uh, really overwhelming for, for them. Yes, the answer to the question, uh, yeah, it's that we need support, but sometimes it's not easy to access or it's not provided to all of us. Thanks, Begonia. And Thomas, is there anything you'd like to add to what Begonia was just saying? Absolutely. Um, it might feel uncomfortable, it might feel weird, but it will be the best thing you ever do. I think that um, finding your community, regardless of what it is, um, is really the key. It would, it, It's transformative for me. Uh, and it would be transformative for absolutely anybody that's struggling with something, regardless, you know, whether it's rare disease, being a carer, sexuality, you name it, finding your community will transform your life for the better. Well, we're coming to the end of this podcast, but if there's a parent listening who's struggling to cope with a young person in their care, is there any advice you'd like to offer them? Yes, one advice, one golden rule, it's always get in touch and connect with other peers, other parents. Sometimes there are patients organizations and it's easy to connect. In other cases, also, we are providing sometimes uh, support programs and, and, and groups at the hospital level. But it's so important to have the opportunity to speak the same language because every disease is different and the symptoms and, you know, the opportunities. There are many things around that you need to share. And of course, the only ones that easily can understand you are your peers. For me, this is a golden rule that sometimes it's also challenging for the parents. And at hospital level, we facilitate these connections with patients' organizations. And Thomas, what are your words of advice for someone who's struggling to cope in their capacity as a carer for a young person? I would say find your community. Um, and also, you can't, it, it's, it sounds trite, but you can't fall from an, an empty cup. You have to take care of yourself so that you can take care of other people. Um, and I, that might sound difficult for people to accept because, you know, you might be thinking, well, I have to look after this person who has significant uh, needs. Um, but actually, you really need to, you know, it's, it's a long game. It's a long game and you have to make the time, if you can, make the space to um, look after yourself, be kind to yourself so that you can, you know, be there long term and um, do as good a job as possible. Okay, Thomas, you've had the last word. That's all we have time for. Thank you both very much indeed. Begonia and Thomas, thank you for being so generous with your time. And I'm sure that what you've told us is going to be really helpful to people who've been listening. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you both again. And thanks to you for listening. We hope to have you with us again very soon for another edition of The Patient Side of the Story. Patient Side of the Story. Stories by Servier Sackley Patient Board. 